speaker is, uh, is Mike Walsh. Um, Mike Walsh has uh, created a, uh, well, he'll tell you what he's doing, he's created a, a carbon trading system in Chicago, uh, for trading. Uh, and Mike is an economist, who he got his degree in Michigan uh, State University. And uh, without further ado, I ran into Mike at a, a White House meeting uh, several months ago, and I'm very impressed with his presentation, so I invited him. Thanks uh, very much, Paul. Can you hear me okay? Uh, good, good morning, everyone, and uh, thanks really for the honor of, of, of joining you this morning. Uh, two terrific presentations to start. Uh, a policy uh, framework and challenge was, was nicely laid out for the, the case of New York State. Uh, the technology uh, of framework and challenges and, and carbon capture and, and management thereof, uh, hugely relevant to what I'm talking about, uh, is, is the market and economic management dimension of greenhouse gases. So my goal this morning is to give you a flavor of what one of, one of, the, lead, one of the lead policy mechanisms to manage greenhouse gases in an intelligent way uh, over time uh, is all about. And the, uh, uh, the verbiage is, 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 is fluctuating as, as politics fluctuate, but uh, the cap and trade policy instrument uh, is, is a tool that has an important place in a full portfolio of actions, including technology R&D, including uh, behavioral change in education, uh, including uh, breakthroughs. Um, and I'll try to put some of those in context. So my goal is to give you a sense of uh, what's the economic nature of the global challenge in managing the risks of global climate change, uh, what are some of the, uh, uh, the options, and, and what's the cost structure look like, and how do we optimize that, what's been the experience in working with cap and trade systems, and what are some of the markets telling us, because they're very information rich when you have a transparent exchange mechanism uh, to reveal a value, uh, the value signals get quite interesting, uh, at least to an economist, uh, hopefully uh, they will to you as well. Um, I think that one of the best uh, uh, framing and uh, pedagogical tools for understanding the challenge of, of managing uh, greenhouse gas concentrations uh, on a global basis over the next several decades was put together uh, at a university up the road. Yes, there are other universities in New Jersey, perhaps nothing like a Rutgers, but the guys at Princeton, Piccolo, and Socolo, in a sense, established a multi-decade budget of how will we take actions that result in the concentration of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere being at an acceptable level, not too much change in how the climate works. And I believe their target goal, uh, using CO2 as the reference, was a concentration of 450 parts per million in the atmosphere. Pre-industrial levels had concentrations of about 290 parts per million. We're currently at about 390 parts per million, rising about two per, uh, uh, parts per million per year. So we're on a very rapid uptake. Now. Um, the budget is a daunting challenge. They said, if we're going to meet this numeric challenge, what could the portfolio of responses look like? And they, they stabilize, they frame, frame what, form what they call a stabilization triangle. If you were able to complete and, thank you, uh, completely implement certain actions in certain mitigation areas, you'd form one of these little wedges of that fuller triangle. These wedges are huge. We talked about the electrification of automobiles and, and, and heating and cooling and, all, and, and population growth uh, to decarbonize electricity. One of the wedges, one of the sub-wedges says triple global nuclear power generation capacity. Triple it from current levels, okay? The United States would have to run real fast to stay in place at nuclear capacity because we're about to retire a bunch of plants. Uh, soils management, agriculture, this is a land-grant university take from approximately a 5 to 10% market penetration of best management practices to have reduced disturbance of soil uh, in, in farming operations, take it from 5 to 10 to 100% to market penetration. Tropical deforestation, global deforestation. Don't slow it down or stop it in a few places. Stop it entirely. Okay, so these are huge challenges. These are fairly called transformational. And by the way, if you don't like nuclear, and you want to meet the goals of this, this, this challenge, you got to make something else bigger. And if you, if you don't like soils management, you got to stop deforestation and reverse it sooner. So this is a tough set of challenges. The good news is, having worked in this space for about 15 years now, I can tell you that a lot of the answers are doable, a lot of the answers are being done, and there's a lot of promise uh, in the near term 
for the technologies that we heard about this morning and the behavioral changes and strategic challenges that we heard about in the very first presentation. Another way uh, to think about what the, uh, the challenge is uh, is framed out by various uh, folks such as McKinsey. I think this is actually in euros. The, the point of this curve is not what the height of the, the, the cost per ton of mitigation is. It's that there's some mitigation responses to greenhouse gases that are not only inexpensive, but they are so big in side benefit that they're negative cost. You'd really be glad you did it, carbon dis uh, displacement aside. Other mitigation actions and, and their width is sort of how much, how much quantitative potential and the height is what does it cost us, okay? So the ideal response to, to managing greenhouse gases on a global basis would be to do these win-win, multi-benefit things first. Do the cheapest things first, uh, exhaust that, that resource, uh, make the higher cost things lower cost by getting better at CCS and so forth. And so in some sense you would go up the supply curve so that we get there at least cost. And uh, in a moment I'll explain to you why we cannot poo-poo least cost, not given the scale of this challenge. Fundamental institutional challenge. If you went to the United Nations these days and said, I'm going to do some of these projects in India or Brazil or China under the UN Kyoto Protocol Clean Development Mechanism. I want to do one of these projects in Mumbai and I want to get credits for it. I could sell those credits to the Japanese or the Europeans towards their Kyoto commitments. Quite possibly they'd say to you, now wait a minute, um, you should be doing those anyways. Those are profitable. We, we the Commissar Commission, have determined these are profitable things to do anyhow. And uh, you want credit? Take a hike. Even though we're not really doing these things. So there's some real paradigm shifts and some real questions people have to ask themselves if these things are so attractive and they're not happening. Do we want to have policy mechanisms that discourage them from going on? Or do we want to have policy mechanisms that actively live with the reality that many of these things are not going on? There's plenty of obvious cost savings that you or I know about but don't get done. Right, so there's a lot of institutional frameworks need to be built, and that's kind of what my company is about, trying to build institutions, get people going, understand, uh, uh, and, and reveal until you try to implement mechanisms, policy and market mechanisms, you don't know what you don't know. And that's one of the most critical risks in, in, in any social endeavor is the unknown unknowns. And you want to make some of those unknowns known, right, by, by trying and error and, and getting progress. Now, in the United States context, there's proposals of various flavors to reduce net greenhouse gas emissions over the next 40 years to uh, something like 20% of current levels, an 80% cut. And any number of e economic models and economists could tell you uh, the proper way to quote unquote estimate the cost to mitigate greenhouse gases, right? And, and what the cost really means as an economist at the end of the day, it's not so much that you have to take some dollars and, and, and buy that carbon capture device, it's that those dollars aren't available for a new hospital. They're not avail available uh, to train a new educator, to build a new highway, to build a new home, right? So it's a resource cost, it's an opportunity cost. A hundred ways you could model it. I'm gonna give you an ultra simple model. What's our current emission levels and where are we trying to get to? And integrate under that curve. You integrate under that curve. Now in, in truth, the emissions have been rising over time, about 1% a year, similar population growth in the US. Remember, we're, we're about one fifth of the global footprint. So in the US, the integral under that curve is a mitigation total over the next 40 years of about 100 billion metric tons CO2. If we find ways that on average yield CO2 mitigation at a cost of $50 a metric ton, the price tag to the US economy over the next 40 uh, years would be $5 trillion. Okay, that's about a third of our current GDP, annual GDP. If we find ways to get the job done, to get the job done, I'm not saying slipshod, I'm saying get the job done at $30 a ton instead of 50, we save $2 trillion over the next 40 years. That's real money. Real money in a world where perhaps a billion, a billion and a half people live hand to mouth, right? I mean, there is global poverty, there is global starvation. It is the case, as Ronald Coe said, that in much of the world today, women are essentially beasts of burden. So if somebody says, no, we can afford the $5 trillion price tag instead of the three, I have a problem, okay, I have a real problem. And if somebody says, the only way we can approach this issue is to um, you know, work on those power plants in, in, in those factories, make sure that we get those guys first. All these other solutions that Pakala and Sacco talked about, you know, we don't know how to do that because it involves forests, it's a little tricky to manage, and soils and, and methane, things that are outside the corporate boundary. If somebody says that we can afford to leave those solutions off the table, they need to tell you 
what's the cost implication they're willing to accept? Or, or if they don't want to incorporate those solutions into a market, what is their way to incorporate those solutions? Because, as Piccolo and Sokolo said, we need them all and we need them at massive scale. And part of the reason I'm setting this up, and I set up this point about the, the clean development mechanism, is a significant amount of the mitigation is not doable under a conventional, industrially applied regulatory emission cap. We need to suck in solutions from as many sectors as we can. And that means that you get into the world of offset projects, which everybody seems to like to argue about, even though it's quite the tail uh, of the dog. Let me uh, continue on that. So do we want to spend $5 billion, uh, trillion, or uh, $3 trillion, and multiply that out by five or six or seven to get to what the global numbers are? We're talking about a lot of money saved, a lot of livelihoods improved, um, if we can get the job done at least cost. And you could say, geez, how could you even put a price tag on saving the fate of the planet? I'm an economist, that's what I do, right? But there is a price to be paid. Um, and it might be very well worth whatever price we pay. This could be the greatest uh, ecological planetary risks we're, we're ever undertaking with, with this experiment with rising uh, carbon and greenhouse gases. Um, so it could be very well worth it, but the question is if we can get the same job done at less cost, let's do it. Our job is to build institutions that are organized, regulated exchanges to help make all of that happen. Okay, so we operate a family of exchanges. We started uh, in the United States in 2003 with the Chicago Climate Exchange, and our philosophy uh, is the following. Um, where there is a carbon or emission regulation established by law, we will help implement that law through provision of a regulated transparent market. That's what we do in our futures exchange for uh, regional greenhouse gas initiative allowances, for US EPA SO2 and NOx allowances. Governments run the programs, we run the market, okay, or host the exchange market. Same in Europe, we've had good luck there for the government mandated instruments, but in places like China, India, the United States, where there are not carbon mandates in place at the federal level, our philosophy is let's work with the coalition of the willing who want to start the process of getting an organized, rules-based market, verified emission reductions uh, in place, and that's what we've done here in the United States. Uh, that's what we're trying to do with our partners in Tianjin, uh, in China, and with partners in India as well. And there's a lot of news coming on that, so watch, watch the wires. Um, the experience here in the United States makes us very bullish that the American mindset, the American universities, the American entrepreneurs can solve this problem. Uh, there's enormous co-benefits that go along with it. It's a very exciting time. And Richard Branson recently got on, on, the, uh, uh, on the, uh, the bandwagon. Welcome to the bandwagon, Richard. He said is the biggest wealth creating opportunity is solving global warming uh, in the next century. And I, if he's right, that's, that's even, even better. What an exchange does in a market is a little bit different from just the existence of having a market. When people are given instruments that they can trade, whether it's a carbon allowance or automobiles or coal uh, or oil, they can trade privately, they can trade through brokerages, or they can trade on a, a regulated exchange. And, the, and, and, they, and all of those pieces have a place, we believe, in, in the market system overall. But uh, an exchange does a few things that help to scale the system in terms of, of flows of capital, provide standards so that everybody working on a common basis so that the capital flows, the trillions of dollars where we need to solve the problem, get allocated out in an efficient way, take some of the price risk that's inevitably coming from the establishment of a new instrument and transfer it from those who don't want the risk or need to manage it from those who are willing uh, to absorb the risk. Uh, have a central mechanism that eliminates counterparty risk so you don't have to worry who you're trading with. Huge problem if you were trading with Lehman, right, or with Bear Stearns. Um, Reveal the prices in a public and transparent way. And, and those of you who've been following any of the financial reform debate or the financial collapse uh, are aware that uh, Congress and regulators really want to see financial and other trading uh, go on to exchanges because they can track things. They know who's done what, when, and the tracking is so good to the point where you can actually run computer algorithms on things and find out, aha, somebody was cheating their customer, and so on. So the uh, desire to have a, a, a regulatory friendly uh, a system as part of what drives regulation. This is what we do. Again, we think it's part of the broader market space. Uh, and let me explain what we've, what we've done. Um, and by the way, just a couple, uh, couple of notes here, reason for optimism. We talked about the need um, to get to uh, a, a billion uh, megawatt hours capacity of, of nuclear. Well, in a pretty short time, we went from essentially, this is globally, uh, essentially no nuclear to 360,000. Uh, 360 million megawatt uh, hours of capacity, 20 years, you know, relatively quickly. I mean, things can change quickly. 
uh, in the United States. Illinois is an example, probably representative. In 1940, 85% uh, of households had coal or coke as a primary heating fuel. I remember going to my grandpa's apartment above a bar right across the street from the, the uh, stockyards in Chicago, and they had this big, you know, nasty belly stove that they cooked uh, briquettes of coal in there. Right? You know, when I was a little kid, they had it gone. Coal gone in 30 years. It's not used in heating uh, in the home at all. So, you know, big changes have happened. You know, we switched to natural gas comprehensively. And the list goes on and on and on. Safety in automobiles, reduction in tobacco usage, production of college graduates. Our country, when we put our mind to it and let entrepreneurs and efficiency into the system uh, can solve some big things. So there's a lot of reasons to be optimistic. I know it's a daunting, a daunting challenge. Um, we've used the cap and trade mechanism with enormous success in the United States. On the left, you see the concentration of sulfur dioxide in the atmosphere, primarily from combustion at, at uh, coal-fired power plants. Uh, before the 1990 Clean Air Act amendments kicked in and after. Okay, so this happened because of the regulatory element of cap and trade. The law said the power sector must reduce emissions and we're going to enforce it. And we're going to give you flexibility to use the market so that those of you who can cut emissions faster and cheaper than others can in effect sort of sell your services to those who find it more expensive to get the job done quickly. So the environmental and, and public health outcomes uh, were not in doubt. This wasn't the market determining how much pollution would happen. The regulations determined how much pollution would happen. The market determined how cheaply we got the job done. And instead of costing us, the consumers, five or six billion dollars a year in compliance costs, it's costing us, the consumers, something like a billion to two billion dollars a year in compliance costs. The Human health benefits of this program are estimated at about $100 billion a year. That's beyond saving the fish, the forest, the visibility, the reduced corrosion on buildings, homes, uh, structures, and so forth. So it's been ch cheap in two hugely important ways. One, it hasn't really uh, disturbed your, your electric bills in any material way. Two, it is so damn cheap that plenty of Republicans, as well as Democrats, are in agreement, let's double down. 50% cut in, in SO2 emissions? Forget that. Let's go to 80 and it's just a question now of how we're going to get there. And I have some price diagrams that show that some of the pathways to how we're going to get there are really causing some, some ripples in the marketplace. But the point is, we got the job done. It was very inexpensive. Broad consensus to go further. It's so cheap, what are we holding back? Okay, so that's very encouraging. We thought this was a terrific model. I had the honor of administering the first three auctions of the SO2 allowances in 1993, 94, and 95. And I should emphasize um, that a lot of people thought this wasn't going to work. And a lot of people said that, you know, the right way is to sell these permits off. And in fact, the government take from selling off emission allowances in this program has been zero. Okay, so there's been a highly functional market, the emissions have come down, and the government hasn't taken any revenue in. Maybe that's not a necessary component. We thought there was a fair model. In 1995, I began working with Doc Sandor, a, a pretty well-known uh, commodity economist. And in 97, we put this test together, testimony together for a house in, uh, or a Senate White House event. And we said, if you're going to get started on a carbon market, it's tough, it's complicated, there's a lot of issues, maybe it's smart to get started with a pilot. Now, of course, who in Washington listens to anybody from Chicago? I don't know. Um, in many cases, Washington is the last to know what's going on in the real world. So we laid this point out and got some nice applause, and they said, you know, don't let the door hit you in the ass on the way home. And uh, a couple of years later, you know, having worked with the industry, worked with governments in, in various places around North America, we came to the conclusion that there was demand for a market, that there was enough people out there who willingly, voluntarily, would want to get started in the measurement, management, baselining, goals, and trading of carbon and other greenhouse gas emission reductions. So we decided to form a voluntary cap and trade system. And through uh, dozens of, 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 of consensus forming meetings involving hundreds of people, nobody was denied entry, everybody was at the table, um, we came up with a structure and said, who wants to play ball and get going uh, in lieu of government action and in need of getting experience and, and rooting out the unknown unknowns. Uh, so we decided to start a voluntary program, uh, a comprehensive system, integra integrated cap and trade system um, with an exchange uh, a structure. And essentially what we have is people said, are you like the Chicago Board of Trade or are you like the EPA? And in this circumstance, we had to be like both. We had to have environmental rules that were hammered out and verified by independent uh, uh, auditors, and we had to have an exchange mechanism. So we really had to combine the two because there hasn't been government leadership on this. 
And I want to spend just a, a minute on this because it gives me a chance to say not only what the structure we agreed in our program is, but what the essence of cap and trade is all about, okay? And there are different ways to sort of get to some of these endpoints, so don't take this as the only, only structure or only rules based, but we took a very simple one. We said, what were your emissions in the year 2000? And the good news is most of the power stations in the United States and, and Canada already had to report to the federal government, so we had good data there. We had pretty good fuel consumption data for most industrials. That's the, 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 the core, you know, how much fuel multiplied by its associated carbon coefficient, audit the calculations, audit the receipts. So what did you emit in the year 2000? Uh, we'll even give you sort of a multi-year window if you think that's more representative. And if your emissions were 100 metric tons of carbon dioxide, that's, that's the currency. What we would do is say, look, we've all agreed by consensus here to drive emissions down 4% below that baseline by the year 2006. So if your emissions were 100, in year zero, or the reference period, the baseline, we're going to give you 99 tradable allowances in the first year, 98, 97, 96, and so on. So the administrator, whether it's the EPA or in our case our registry, hands out tradable allowances, and at the end of every year we say, aha, your metered emissions and your verification report of those say that your emissions were below your allotment. You only emitted 97 tons. You've got two extra credits two extra allowances. I don't know if maybe your, your business was slow or you found a cheap way to cut emissions, but you got the job done. If you got two extra allowances, you can either sell those allowances to somebody else in the system who did not make compliance, who did not make the reduction, or you can hold on to the allowances and use them for later years. Because every spring, we say you have to turn back the number of allowances equal to your emissions. And if your emissions didn't come down to 99, but let's say they went up to 101, then you got to go buy two credits from somebody else. The point being, those who can cut emissions cheapest are encouraged to do more of it. Those who find it cheaper to hire somebody else to make the cut for them, do that. The cheapest pathway in some cases is to build internally the solution. The cheapest pathway sometimes is to buy the solution. But as a group, the emissions have to come down. Okay, so it's either cut, cut more than the required amount, you can sell or bank. You cut less, you have to buy. And in a fully-fledged market that has all players involved, as opposed to a, a voluntary market that attracts a bias sample, admittedly, um, in a full coverage market, that interaction of the high cost and the low cost uh, mitigation sources should yield you the marginal cost of abatement. Okay, that's in the textbook uh, uh, application of this. In fact, the marginal cost of abatement in the sulfur dioxide program has sometimes been burn a little less coal, burn a little more natural gas, which has essentially no SO2. Uh, burn the same coal, but install a scrubber. In Europe, in the carbon market, we see that the marginal cost of abatement is often burn a little less coal in power generation, burn a little more natural gas. It tends to have about half the carbon footprint per megawatt hour. Okay? So that interaction of supply and demand re reveals uh, the marginal cost of abatement. In our market, I can't say that it's been doing that. We don't have a, a full coverage market, um, and we've had uh, uh, some big, big events in the last uh, couple of years that I'll, I'll, I'll discuss. Now, halfway through this program, the members of the exchange, you'll, you'll see in just a moment, said, hey, this is working. We're learning. We have an answer for our shareholders. We're getting smart. We understand what the policymakers are arguing about now, where we didn't before. We're ready for our European operations to be able to trade emissions, which we never did before. If we're a Ford or a DuPont, we're being regulated in Europe. Let's keep going. We said we'll cut to 6% below baseline by 2010. And those folks who are just sort of getting on board here and, and following what's going on, maybe give them a chance to catch up. They, they don't have to come down you know, immediately to this level. Let them slowly phase in. And maybe that has some, some value in considering how we work with developing countries who we want to bring into the, fig, into the mix at some point, and, uh, but you don't expect people to slam on the brakes. Okay? Now, the existence of the Chicago Climate Exchange was by no means assumed or intended to displace policy. Quite the opposite. We figured it was coming. This is a chance to get people ready and to inform the structure. Now, um, one of the reasons that people are doing this uh, is that they felt it was a good idea to get going and a sort of slow but early and steady emission reduction schedule would put them ahead of where the policy proposals are. And sure enough, if you stayed on this trajectory, um, you would be well ahead of what the, uh, you don't quite see the full guide here, but this is, I think, the, the, the uh, White House proposal, the Waxman-Markey bill. The Reggie system requires that for the first six years that emissions not rise above baseline. So a lot of our members are in, indeed well ahead of where they uh, needed to be. And I would emphasize again that there is a headwind. We have had systemically in the last few years accepted an upward rising, uh, steadily rising 
uh, total amount of emissions. And that, that makes the, the, the cuts uh, even tougher. Now, as I indicated, we wanted to weave together a 500-page rule book, it's 800 pages now, um, with a, a registry account where people have the record of all their emissions, uh, their trading activity, their allotment and purchase and sale of allowances or, or project-based offset credits. Uh, all the trading occurs on a single trading platform uh, that's widely visible uh, to regulators, and we have lots of people keeping their eye on that as well, making sure there's no hanky-panky. Um, and here are some of the entities that joined. Um, public sector, private sector, heavy industry, uh, pulp and paper quite a bit, uh, power generators, uh, PSE&G recently joined the exchange. They felt it would help them get a little bit further up the curve, so we much appreciate that. A very respected company, you, sh you should be aware, respected uh, nationally and, and around the world. Um, and the, kind of the full list has uh, you know, about two dozen power companies, um, a lot of heavy manufacturers who knew they'd be regulated overseas and wanted to get ready for it, um, folks who could possibly make money. Uh, by capturing methane, one of the nice win-win uh, solutions, of which there are many. Um, the uh, cities and states wanted to sort of the lead, you know, by example and, and show that they uh, uh, not only are, are good at talking about it, but actually doing something. Uh, you all know that some of these big campuses, uh, Big Ten, Big 12, are like small cities. Um, so they wanted to get in some of the research uh, opportunities. And I have to tell you, the universities have really grabbed it. Many of them are, are very active in our committees. A lot of the learning and institution building goes on in our governance committees. There's been approximately 400 committee meetings since we started the exchange. And these folks aren't sitting around playing tiddlywinks. Two or three hours of forest carbon growth coefficients, you know, I can tell you it gets uh, your eyes glass over. But there's an intense amount of learning that goes on in, in the self-governance structure. Um, and this is what our members uh, sort of as a group have told us. There's a, about 100 emitters. There's probably 1,000 reasons they've joined. But as a general matter, uh, to get emissions, have an emissions audit, to get some practical experience, to put a carbon price into the business model, make this part of uh, the, the operation going forward. Uh, hey, maybe you can even make some money at it um, and have an answer to your shareholders and to the lawsuits and the other uh, unpleasantries that are going on uh, around carbon. And, you know, we spend time with our members and we spend time with folks who are not our members trying to make them members. And, you know, I had one of our members, the CEO, said, you know, my board used to be stunned and scared of the carbon issue. It's not that big a deal. They get it now. They have, have a management challenge integrated into the business. Having worked through it, not that scary. You know, so um, we see that all the time, that the members of the exchange are, are smarter and way ahead of their competitors on this, and I, I applaud them for that. Um, this has turned into a pretty good-sized block of emissions. A um, couple of, of points I'll make with this, this graphic. There's about uh, almost 700 million metric tons of CO2 under the cap. Uh, the German and the European systems include about half of their national emissions under their caps. Very important point in relation to the New York strategy. Um, the Europeans are saying for automobiles, residential, small commerce, we're not going to use cap and trade. We're going to use other efficiency standards and other drivers. Um, but the, the next biggest cap, which is uh, power stations and heavy industry, uh, is in Germany. It's got about a half a billion tons under the cap. Uh, the Reggie system here in the Northeast, uh, power plant only has about uh, a, a little under 200 million tons. So there's pretty good scale here. So we've had to test out a lot of different rules and protocols, and that was uh, part of the point. Uh, now, onto this uh, strangely controversial topic called offsets. Uh, as I indicated, many, many of the available mitigation options that often have uh, energy savings, water quality savings, wildlife benefit, um, uh, climate resilience benefits cannot be forced to occur. We in America are not going to tell people, you got an acre of land, put 100 trees on it. This is not how we roll. Okay? Now, if you want to put 100 trees on it, and they can soak up carbon, we have a table and a coefficient, and you keep the trees there, we'll give you a credit. If you want to capture landfill gas, you want to capture agricultural methane, you want to go out and find those tanks of ozone-depleting substances that are slowly but surely leaking and nobody's responsible for them, and destroy those gases, reduce global warming and ozone layer damage, we'll give you a credit. And the credits have to follow strict protocols, have to be independently verified. Simple example here, that's a Minnesota dairy farmer. He was on the McNeil Lair report. This, this is one of these true believers. He's a great guy, terrific uh, Minnesota accent. He's got a check there for $10,000 from his methane capture and destruction system. He takes the methane, instead of going into the air and smelling the neighborhood up, he uses it for heat, saves on electric bills, saves on, on heating bills. And the typical Minnesota dairy farmer, on average, makes about $60,000 a year. Okay? So a $10,000 boost to his bottom line is, is, is meaningful. It's very interesting to these folks. Okay? And now I got an ally. 
in the agriculture world, which by and large is not real happy about carbon limitations. To get offsets into the system, you need people to go out and verify them, you need to train those verifiers, and you need people to bundle them up. So these folks, instead of us dealing with 10,000 farmers co farmer contract by farmer contract, we let the Iowa Farm Bureau or the National Farmers Union take care of that. So they serve as bundlers. That's all worked. And I gotta tell you, all of the pieces of the system, multi-sector, project-based credits, agriculture, forestry, we see no showstoppers. We really don't expect that there's any major problems. There's some conceptual problems in defining things, admittedly, there's some real challenges, and it's not all solved. But cap and trade in multiple sectors we think can work. Um, the agriculture thing is kind of interesting because there are some folks who think it's a good idea. So while it's not the case that we can solve global warming just by treating our lands and forests better, it can help. And we can get cleaner water, and we can put a little more income into rural uh, economies and uh, help them be more climate resilient. Um, here's been some of the results, and I want to emphasize one thing uh, first. Uh, people want to spend a lot of time arguing about uh, so-called offsets. And that's okay, provided it's put in some context. Because I've heard people critique the notion of markets or cap and trade generally by critiquing the offsets. Well, that dog's not going to hunt, okay? In the Chicago Climate Exchange, the emission cuts by the members at their facilities have been running in the range of about 10% of the system-wide baseline each year. So they've beaten their cuts. Maybe we got the guys who could do it. Fair enough. It's about 10% of baseline. Offsets have been flowing in at a rate of around 2% of baseline. So some perspective. Suppose you decided that all, that's, all that decades of soil science history that we incorporated into our soil carbon rules and all those farmers, that was all bunk. It meant nothing. There was no extra gain. That was all no good. What that would mean is that instead of realizing a 12% annual chunk of progress, we're achieving an 11. So what? You know, if anybody can tell you that the science of global climate change at, at current status is much more refined than we need less carbon. I think you're misleading you. We don't really know a hell of a lot more than that. We just know that we need less. We can't tell you when the benefit is, what form, what that value of the benefit is, who benefits, where and how. We have some rough sense, but we know we need less. So the question is, are you going to be willing to take a chance that some of the tricky, inherently tricky questions in this space that bring in new solutions, new players, new supporters, new constituents, new innovation, that we can't afford to take that chance because our precision of knowledge of global climate change is so refined that that one percentage error is gonna be a huge problem. We're not there yet, people, and we need these people. Okay, we need these answers. In the European Union system, total offsets have been flowing in from the clean development mechanism at a rate of around 2% of baseline. So if half of them were crap, instead of Europe achieving something like a 7% cut by 2012, they'll have achieved a six, okay? So people need to take a deep breath and ask themselves, why do we have offsets? And there's a whole bunch of good reasons, but at the end of the day, they're the tail of the dog. So just uh, a little bit of perspective. Here's what the members have done at their own facilities. A bunch of this is win-win. They save money. They have more comfortable and productive facilities. Um, they uh, are less exposed to fuel price fluctuations. Uh, some of the fuel price hedg uh, hedging strategies that they had weren't being fully covered. They didn't even know it until they got an audit. Okay, these are, these are real examples. Uh, they're closing the doors. When I say closing the doors, Rolls-Royce is closing the door at a jet engine test facility after they do, the, they do the test. It's a big door. Okay, so you save a lot of money by not having to heat the outside because you, in fact, did close the door. So we see folks in the, in the high-tech area uh, IBM, uh, ST Microelectronics, um, who can uh, Intel modify the way they uh, clean, do the plasma clean process in their semiconductor fab plants. Okay, so those are some of the high potency gases. Capture of methane is a real winner in multiple ways. Coal mine safety, uh, uh, air quality, free natural gas, right? So a lot of these things are, are energy uh, security advances, their competitiveness advantages, uh, and their uh, uh, business performance advantages. Uh, very encouraging, you know, all that win-win that's out there. There will be cost, make no mistake, and it's not free in some cases to get these multi-benefit uh, solutions, but, but they're there, and they're, they're, they're now. Um, let me just wrap up by talking about some pricing uh, performance, because we are an exchange, and, and transparent prices are one of the more, more uh, valuable social byproducts. 
in our market, uh, the average uh, price, weighted average price over the last uh, seven years has been about $4 a metric ton CO2. It's down to essentially zero now. And it's really been kind of a perfect storm around what our program is about. Um, one, the economy uh, tanked, so anybody who might have needed to buy emissions allowances in the program in the past probably doesn't have to, their emissions are well down. Two, uh, the financial side of the industry, people who might invest in these things because they think, hey, this could turn into something either in the short term or if, if a federal policy comes in, those guys are either gone or spooked away, not gone from our market, but gone from financial circumstances. Uh, and the policy arena is really up in the air. Nobody knows whether there'll be a federal action, and what form it will take, whether it will incorporate any of our surplus allowances or not. And in many parts of the emissions markets, you'll see another example in a moment, um, the financial community is kind of like, I don't know about this policy stuff. You know, I'm a little scared. So there's been some spooking uh, from the emissions markets. The REGI prices, uh, all of the allowances are auctioned off in the REGI system. New Jersey is, is part of the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative. Those prices are essentially at their theoretical minimum as well. The administrators put a minimum price at $1.86 a ton, and the price has been not much above it for some of the very same reasons I just mentioned, identical reasons. We also, uh, there's, a, there's a voluntary uh, uh, product in California, offsets. We offer a futures market for that. Their prices are down, but the prospect of a California law being implemented or a Western law being implemented or a federal law being implemented is giving some life to that instrument. We've got futures uh, uh, products on our Chicago Climate Futures Exchange that are what you might call contingent futures contracts. We call it the uh, Carbon Financial Instrument US. This is an instrument that says if there's a federal law in place in 2013, you, the seller, must deliver a federal allowance. If there's not, you have to deliver a backup, either a REGI allowance or a European Union allowance. And in the, in the words of the commodity world, cheapest to deliver, the cheapest thing to deliver and fulfill your commitments would be a REGI allowance. You take these prices, put in some probabilities and a residual value for a REGI price, the market, a thin market, but the thin market is saying to us that they really don't think there's a very high chance of a federal law being in place in the near future. Very low chance, okay? And you can see uh, other versions of that at the in-trade market in London and so forth. Um, this is one of the things I like to see happen, though. Uh, these are a bunch of folks in Kerala State in India um, who uh, fairly widespread installation of these micro-digesters where they take dung, uh, put it in there, generate methane, and use that methane, which is a, quite a, a nice gas, as a cooking fuel. It's, it's natural gas. So instead of burning wood in the home, causing all sorts of lung diseases and forcing the daughters, it's always the daughters who go out and collect wood all day, now the daughters go to school instead of collecting wood all day, which is a traditional way to, to make fire uh, in the house. This is my colleague Morali, uh, he organized these guys. Uh, he's actually in India right now working on a joint venture deal over there. Um, and the whole town comes out, right? And another innovation, so these are folks who got some of these credits and sold them on our exchange. They established, I don't know if any of you have been to India, but the postal system is a, you know, a major institution in India, in part because the country is so rural, they established a debit card that if you were the seller of one of these credits, you can get a debit card and go down to the postal uh, a service office and, and get your cash. So this has kind of got you know, social and financial uh, ramifications and we think important development opportunities too. It's not a lot of money, but in Kerala State, India, a little bit of money is a lot of money, okay? Um, I forgot what I put together, but I thought I would give you a quick summary of where we think uh, the U.S. might go the EPA has authority to act on greenhouse gases. Nobody wants that really to happen because they know that EPA can be kind of clumsy in following the law they're required to follow. We might have a more limited uh, domestic cap and trade system. It's possible we'll have an international carbon market. I think that's a, a minimum five to 10 year horizon. I'm not terribly concerned that we don't get integrated internationally right away. We have a lot of cheap cuts to make uh, just domestically. Um, if we do uh, these things, it's uh, becoming clearer by the day it's dawning on people that there's a lot of pieces of this. Yeah, you have international agreements, but that, they mean nothing without domestic implementation. You need national environment ministries, but you also need, if you're gonna have a market, you need to monitor and enforce that market. And you've introduced a new article of trade, and the Europeans are sort of learning it every day. Um, if there's a internet-based system, guess what? People will ask you for your password. They'll fish. And guess what? Some people will give up your password, okay? If there's a sales tax system that you can tweak or, or manipulate, and it relates to carbon allowances, I have shocking news. Somebody will abuse the system, right? So any new article of trade, any new mechanism of trade, you have to stay on top of it as a part of commerce, right? This isn't just environmental regulation. And um, our futures exchange, uh, very quickly, 
uh, we operate a futures exchange here in, in London, um, standardized contracts, anonymous trading, um, uh, regulated, uh, that's a key element that the uh, government likes. Um, and the hedging mechanism that a futures exchange is about is to allow for people to transfer price risk in an orderly, transparent environment. And if we impose a carbon cap on our industries, it's a significant new price risk uh, to be managed, and uh, that's what the exchange is, 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 is there for. Um, the uh, clearing members of the exchange uh, take away the problem that a lot of the financial calamity involved. They, they take away the possibility that there's a, 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 a thin reed in the system by providing a clearing structure that has reinforcement uh, and, and financial guarantees. Um, and just a side note, when somebody trades an SO2 or NOx allowance in our exchange, they're potentially subject to up to, I guess I could count them, uh, seven different sort of points of regulation. All right, six or seven. You've got the environment authorities, you've got state utility commissions and consumer uh, advocates, you've got the Commodity Futures Trading Commission and the other pieces that it requires. So, you know, this isn't wild free market. This is pretty heavy, heavily regulated. I'm going to wrap up. Um, the markets for SO2 are saying we're not very confident that uh, over the next few years, the instruments we hold now are going to keep value. They're very concerned that the way we're transitioning to the tighter limits might nullify the existing value, and there's, people are quite spooked. And this is what the futures exchange can reveal to you. What's the market think about a few years out? Not thinking a lot about SO2. In uh, Europe, we see that the allowance price has always traded above the offset price, even though the limits on using the offsets, the certified emission reductions, really don't matter. The market seems to have an inherent bias against them, and maybe we'd see that here uh, in the US. It's always been in the range of 10 to 15 percent. Um, the prices, well, you know, this is part of commerce now. What, what, what drives allowance prices? Is it crude oil prices? Eh, sometimes it looks like it's crude oil prices, sometimes not. Is it German power prices? When German power prices are higher, coal combustion goes up because more power gets generated in Germany, which is majority coal. Eh, it seems to be a driver, not so sure. Market prices are a multivariate phenomenon. And people are managing real economic risk using these instruments, and eh, you haven't quite nailed down yet the relationships, probably because the relationships aren't, aren't static. But this is the world that the energy uh, community lives in now. They've got allowances and they've got you know, fuels. Uh, let me wrap it up. These are some of the uh, things that seem to make sense from our point of view as to what businesses uh, should be doing uh, to get ready, uh, to get their hands on, get used to working in a carbon-constrained environment, uh, put a shadow price on carbon. Um, you know, if there was a carbon limitation, what does that mean for investment Y versus investment uh, Z? Um, and just get some experience. And, and, and understand what this is all about. Standing on the sidelines is really not a sensible option when there are many different directions from which regulation could come. I went on a little bit too long. I apologize for that. I hope there are some comments and questions now and um, informally in the, in, in the follow-up. Yeah, the, the gentlelady is asking, um, California, among other places, are proposing something called a low carbon fuel standard where the delivered gallon of fuel needs to have less carbon than a pure sort of gallon of gasoline and there are going to be credits to those who do better than, than the goals uh, and they have to be bought by those who don't do as well. It's very similar to the renewable energy credit system for wind power and so forth. Do I think it can be efficient? Um, I I, my initial reaction is I, I think it can, but I think there's a lot of complication around those rules. I think we're a long way from being there. Um, but in general, something that introduces flexibility um, that the participants will take advantage of. Uh, you know, are there multiple participant, participants and, and do they differ in their costs? If so, then the trading would improve the cost uh, of compliance overall. But they might face the same cost to comply and there may not be a lot of players. So, uh, time you know, will tell whether that will be an efficient uh, uh, approach forward. Right? And it may be clear, a market mechanism doesn't always make sense. Right? In some cases, it makes sense to, to mandate, use this technology um, or, or use a fuel type. Okay? But in many cases, it can make sense.
Yeah, this is, uh, I think people are able to hear that question. Uh, it's one of the live discussions as to how expansive should the cap and trade system be. And there are proposals on the table that unlike the European case, where we just hit the power plants, which are about a third of the US footprint, and the manufacturers, which for their own fuel is around 10%, do we also bring in the transportation sector and require the refiners to be responsible for the carbon content of their fuels, which brings in another third. So now you're up to 75%. Maybe you can even go to natural gas distributors, and then you're up to 85%. Some people are very, very uncomfortable with that holistic approach, and, and some middle-of-the-road Republican senators are prone to say, we know how power plant cap-and-trade works, let's use it. Um, what that'll mean, obviously, you leave open the question as to how you address the emissions in the other sectors. Um, I think what it'd mean um, is that, you know, those guys are going to be looking for a lot of offsets near term and they're going to be switching to gas uh, more than they already are. There's very little coal construction or expansion going on now. In terms of what it means to allowance prices, um, I think you have a smaller pool of buyers chasing a readily available pool of offsets domestically and internationally. But I would emphasize offsets do not flow in you know, like Niagara Falls. It takes a long time for people to get used to working with the system, understanding the rules, and committing themselves uh, to it. So the numbers, I think, will be modest. Um, I, I would suspect, though, compared to a broader coverage system, it would be a little bit lower in price. And um, I think there's a fair chance that's the way it's going to play out, Joe. Uh, I'm not sure I've addressed the question because it's a, a fairly open-ended one. But. Yes. Um, I think, let me make sure I understand your question. Oh, you think if the prices stay at zero? Well, I yeah. Well, uh, that's a good question. So I think the question is if you see that um, the returns come in at, at low cost or the, the market's not very tight, do you do something to tighten it? And um, we're, we're having those discussions as we speak. Uh, we're, we're considering an extended uh, phase because the feds are moving slowly and maybe having a phase three. But let me you know, sort of repeat a key point. Um, a lot of what we tried to do was to get people up the knowledge curve, build institutions, test out procedures. But when you see in Europe or in the SO2 program that the, the emission cuts are being achieved and the price of the permits is low, that's the time to pop that champagne cork. This is the success, if, if you're getting the goal achieved. Because some people want to say, oh, the price is too low. But if we're hitting the targets and the price is low, that should really be celebration time. Now, it might not be enough of a driver, the permit price, to cause the socially optimal amount of R&D, uh, of technical development, and maybe you need to throw other, other weapons at it, whether it's federal investment or research and development tax credits, whatever the case may be. Um, but in a shorter term environment, if you're getting there and, it's, and the permits are low and you've really enforced the laws, um, that's really good news. And we've seen that. It has really worked out pretty well. And the Europeans are hitting their goals, by the way, uh, in, in case of, of, of those who are, who are taking a shot at them. So I think with that, I, I really would like the, the chance to visit a little bit more and maybe at the, the luncheon and the break we can do that. And thank you very much again.